Aye, kuwe kuwa madue. Aye, kuwe kuwa madue. Aye, kuwe kuwa madue. Aye, kuwe kuwa madue. See, when we had a high school, Centennial High School. Centennial is the same high school that. Uh, Oh, I don't know that boy. It's not important. It's a rapper. Okay. <laughs> he, could, he came through several generations after me. Okay. Uh, but uh, Centennial was built to siphon off black and Mexican kids from Compton High School. Compton High mm -hmm. School at that time was all white. Of course, now it's all Mexican and black, but then it was all white. And so they built Centennial, Centennial High on Central and El Segundo. And that school was 75% black and 25% Latina. Uh, and so there were black men teachers who really kind of looked out for uh, the young black men who were going to school there because they knew what was coming. We didn't. I mean, we lived in a pretty insular community of, of black folks. Um, hmm. And interestingly enough, I had a teacher in the fifth grade, a Mrs. Fox, white woman. I haven't seen her since. But in her class, she did a thing with history. That was the curriculum, fifth grade. And mm -hmm. uh, so she had a Jeopardy thing where she'd divide the kids into two teams, mm -hmm. and every Friday, we just answered questions as long as we could. Uh, I, she picked me as one of the captains. Oh, cool. And it was in that classroom I realized that, oh, you have something between your ears that you can ride. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I discovered I had some intelligence, you can talk to me no more, no matter what they did. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting who can influence your life. And it's important to, I think, honor them. Absolutely, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, you were in Compton, we've, you said 17? Until I was 17. About 17, and did you uh, come to Oakland after that, or? I went to school, I went away to a school called Sterling College in uh, Kansas, which okay. was a Presbyterian school, because my grades were pretty bad by the time I graduated. I, start, I read everything, go back, I read everything in the library uh, all through middle school and the first couple of years of high school. And then about the 11th grade, I discovered girls and I stopped reading. And, uh, you know, so, and I stopped studying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my grades were like C's. Mm -hmm. And so my minister got me into Sterling College, which was a small 500 a student Presbyterian college in semi-rural Kansas, 500 students, two black students. So I stayed there a year and a half and learned to hate it, because Kansas ain't that far from Mississippi, really. Um, and then after the second semester of my second year, I transferred to Knoxville College in Knoxville, Tennessee, also a Presbyterian college. Um, about 800 students, and maybe there were 10 of them that were white. Um, remember, I was born into a segregated world. I mean, seriously, it's still segregated, but no, you did ride on the back of the bus kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so um, by then I was 19. Mm -hmm. And um, I announced to my family that I was going to Mississippi to work for something called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, for the summer of 1964. And of course, they were terrified. They knew stuff I didn't know, my family did. Like that my family ultimately came from Oakland, Mississippi in the Delta okay. in 1877, right after the Civil War. They had to escape from there. Mm -hmm. They knew all of that, they didn't talk about it. I didn't know nothing. I thought I was, you know, I mean, as a church camps and stuff I went to. We worked on Indian reservations mm -hmm. when I was a teenager and all that stuff. I, that's what I thought we were doing. Mm -hmm. Now we spent a week in uh, Oxford, Mississippi to Oxford, Ohio, 
at a university. They were trying to prepare us to go into Mississippi. And they were trying to get our attention that this is serious. These people kill you. Um, we didn't get it until the weekend I was supposed to go down and did go down to Mississippi. Uh, three civil rights workers disappeared. Wow. Uh, Goodman, Swarner, and Cheney. And uh, the uh, black Mississippi uh, staff, they said they're dead. And the rest of them were like, how could that be? You know? This, yeah. Wow. And in fact, they were dead. It's terrifying. Uh, they sent me to a town that was 50 miles away from where those brothers died. And you start to get a little more serious about Mississippi is lethal. Now, they sent 950 students to Mississippi that summer for that SMR project. Mm -hmm. And about 900 of them were white. About 50 of us were black. And if what became clear over time was had they just sent black students into Mississippi for that summer, they would have put us in the river too. But because there were white students from Michigan and Cal Berkeley and Harvard, all kinds of, I mean, they only recruited the children of the ruling class, mm -hmm. as they call it. Um, when those students came in, they brought with them their families, mm -hmm. their local newspapers, black and white TV. And so that caused the president, whoever it was at that time, probably Lyndon Johnson, uh, like, no, we cannot allow those kids to be killed. So they sent in the FBI, you know, and the uh, Justice Department. And it kept us alive. I mean, that, and that's realistically, if you go back and look at, there was a speech that Julian Bond made in 19, no, 2014, at the 60th anniversary. Uh, maybe it was the 50th anniversary of the, name, of the summer project, um, where he laid it out. The decision was made by Bob Moses, who was a project, uh, state project director. Uh, Bob just passed away this year. Um, that even though there was an argument that bringing all these white students into Mississippi would rob the local people of their agency, you know, because they could come in and type and run mimeograph machines, and we're, we were learning to do that. Right. Um, that until SNCC changed the metrics, that Mississippi was going to continue to kill black people, and the rest of the country was just going to look away. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, bring some white folks in here and uh, see what happens next. And what happened was we broke open the state. I don't know what the question is anymore. No, I've, you were just, you know, given the history and your background for after you moved um, oh. initially. So, which is, no, this is very, it's very interesting. And just following that, I mean, just having that experience, how did that change, I guess, the way you were looking at society and things when going into <laughs> Mississippi and, and having all these, uh, you know, experiences. I just read a book named Cast, and I can't think of the rest of the name, but it's by a woman by the name of Wilkerson. And it, she also wrote a, another book called Warmth of the Other Sun, uh, which really chronicles the, the migration of black folks from the south to the north, west, and east. Um, maybe seven million of us, because we weren't here before. Um, and this was like from the 1910, 1920 through 1950s. Now I guess some are going back. But anyway, this book on caste talks about <sighs> that the way our society is structured, it doesn't matter how much education we get, mm -hmm. how much wealth we get, it's still designed to keep us in place. Now, I was raised, as my parents were raised, to believe that if we did the right thing, if we lived good lives, that we got education, we went to church, we dressed well, did all that stuff, that they would stop killing us. And what Cass points out is, that ain't true. We have to do something else. So I don't know what I would have done differently 
had I understood at 19 and 20 what that book explains. I probably would have done something different. I don't know what that was, that event. But I believed in lifting up yourself by your own bootstraps. Ups, <laughs> ups uh one brother calls it, you know, that uh, we can be, just be better. Which also flips to the Bill Cosby thing of if we would just do right. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to curse on this film, so, you know, it's just bull. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter. So, um, in Mississippi, you know, as a young black man, uh, in this country, in the 19, whatever that was, 60s, early 60s, um, there were not the LeBron Jameses of the world, the Stephen Currys, uh, or the Obamas. Uh, it was difficult to determine what you could be. And who. I didn't want to be my minister. I definitely didn't want to be my stepfather. I didn't even understand my grandfather. So I'm looking around, you know. And um, when I joined SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I found brothers who were like myself. A lot of them from Harlem and DC, and they knew a lot more than me. Uh, but they had a spirit about them. And so what I found in Mississippi was purpose. I saw in the eyes of the folks that I worked with, as humble as their surroundings were, I saw in their eyes a reflection of me as a young black man who had value. At any rate, uh, they changed my life. They changed the way I saw the world. And so I spent the rest of my life, uh, the next 50 years, trying to live a life of which they might be proud. Trying to, well, I spent <laughs> my 20s. Uh, you know, I moved from Mississippi. I moved from Mississippi to San Francisco in 65. Okay. Wow. And I worked for SNCC there, raising money and doing educational programs. Um, and then SNCC dissolved at the end of 66, um, right as the Panthers were rising. And so you didn't have to be a Panther you to be in their sphere of influence of, of, the, of the way they saw the world. And my wife was out there at San Francisco State in the Black Student Union. Uh, they're striking. It was just, it was a hell of a time in the Bay. Uh, free speech movement, was <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Farm workers are going on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my next ideological leap. You know, I grew up as, I thought about being a minister at 15 or 16. But when we started reading the Red Book and Mao Zedong and all them folks uh, in the 60s, uh, we became materialists, dialectical materialists, which is there is no God kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had our education groups where we'd read and discuss and all of that. And uh, we learned to uh, buy guns and, and arm ourselves for self-defense. I'm not sure how that was going to work. But anyway, uh, it's a good theory. Um, because white folks always had more guns than we were going to have. Yeah. But um, so I moved from the nonviolence of the South to the self-defense of the North. And this is like, you get whiplash doing this stuff. I mean, between 62 and 66, that happened. Um, and after SNCC dissolved, I started organizing young black men in the Fillmore. Uh, I had spoken at a high school up near Golden Gate Park. And a couple of the brothers after the, I spoke, I was talking about the South. They said, well, can you organize us here? And so we started. We had about 20 young men. Oh, man. So, OK. okay. We'll just, that takes me there. That takes you there. I actually would like to speak a little bit more, hear more from you uh, about your experiences um, helping young people just and that's been part of your career as well. So, you know, just you know, please expound on that. Just um, working in juvenile halls and things. What are, 
what are some of the things that you've learned from just being in close proximity to quote unquote the you know the wild children and and you know and that and just how's that framed your uh, your sense? So I'm on the Warden's Advisory Board at San Quentin, have been probably 15 years, and um, so I get to see youngsters in juvenile hall, and I get to see them in our state prison system. Some of the brightest people I've ever met in my life are in those systems. They haven't had a venue that they could show their brightness in different ways. Um, Felix Mitchell had a huge drug empire. He was a huge businessman, but he didn't have a vehicle to show that brilliance in other ways because he was not introduced to that. Um, I think that our young people are a tremendous resource I think many of the young people who are in um, our juvenile system and our prison system have been young people who have been um, either physically or even worse, psychologically abused. I mean, you could be physically abused and healed, but the psycho psychological abuse, um, the trauma of that stays with you your whole life, you know. Um, so I think our young people are a tremendous resource. I think that we spend money at two ends. We spend money on m my children and children like my children, mm -hmm. allow them to travel, to take courses. And we spend money at the other end. We might spend $200,000 on a youngster who's in trouble, but it's the middle. Mm -hmm. It's where our brilliance really is, but we don't spend money there. You either have to be a, a middle class family or you have to get in trouble to have resources, but in here. And so as long as our kids are doing okay, then we don't pay them any attention. But it's when they, when they get into trouble that we want to pay them attention. But we also want to say, that's a bad kid. How did he get it and all that? Well, he, he, what they pick up is from us as adults. And you also have from the womb to the tomb, babies making babies, you know? And so uh, I think that we have a responsibility to our young people to make sure that they have what they need to grow up in a healthy environment, mm -hmm. environment that is nurturing, environment that cares. I think we need to expose them to different things. Um, um, one, of the th one of the dreams that I had for a long time was being able to take some young brothers over to uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. So we're able to take 13 youngsters over to Africa in 2018 or 19 to South Africa. Wow. To just give them the experience and have them understand that MacArthur and, um, and um, Broadway, mm -hmm. I will kill you for MacArthur and Broadway because I think that's all I got. But mm -hmm. When I, once I realized I'm a, I'm a, all this is mine, this whole world is mine. Right. You know, whether I'm in India or Africa or England or where, this, this is all mine. Mm -hmm. And so having a sense that the world is bigger than your block, I think we owe that to our, our, to our, our youngsters. Um, I think that we have to train our youngsters, not let them grow up, because a lot of our youngsters grow up with their peers, and their peers um, um, cause, encourage them to be who they are. And I think we as adults have to be responsible for our young people and be proactive in providing an environment for them that helps them grow. I garden a lot. Mm -hmm. And I know when, my, when I first moved to where I live, my soil was clay, it was thick, it was hard. And the little plants that grow would be just so big. Mm -hmm. Over the years, that big plant is now this big because I worked the soil. Our young people are very same way. They're, they're fertile. And if we provide the right nutrients to them, the right opportunities to grow, they will grow. But because we're afraid of them, because I'm not fooling with them, I'm not then our youngsters are struggle, you know, they suffer, 
and then we point fingers at them as if they're from another planet. So, uh, yeah, that's what goes on in my mind. I'm just, mm -hmm. and I'm also proud of our, of, of our young son. I'm proud of, of the folk that I'm sitting before. I mean, very, very proud, uh, you know, and um, I, I know the majority of our young people are really um, moving in the right direction. Yeah. But as I said, the ones we focus on are the ones who are struggling, and they might be struggling for various reasons. So anyway, yeah. out of the mud grows a lotus. Out of the mud grows a lotus. And just, uh, you mentioned earlier, um, going to school, I think, uh, on the East Coast yeah. for, for college, and what was that experience like as you, you know, as you're going, because that's, there are, you know, some similarities, like you mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, how New York uh, operates, and as you mentioned, like Berkeley High, like some of those dynamics about people will respond to certain things, but they expect some level of activity will be going on. So, yeah. you know, some people go, what, how'd you feel when you, you went to the East Coast? Yeah, it was a whole nother trip. Damn, I, I really enjoyed my time. I was in New York City for the most part. I was an undergrad at Columbia University. And so I was uptown, which I really loved. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think I would have done well. I had some friends down at NYU, like in, in what felt like more hardball city and and that that was fun to go visit but it felt disorienting but um you know one one good thing is i do have fam in new york so i have uh an aunt i have a handful of cousins uh my grandpa who's passed since was in his early 90s at the time out in um he was like in Jamaica and then moved to Little Neck. So I would like hop to LIR out there and, nice. and go see him. But, you know, it was one thing I, I came to appreciate um, and didn't come in with necessarily again, because I, you know, I'd visited New York a bunch, so like right. not it, it, every couple of years to go see my family. So that that wasn't super foreign to me or super new to me. Um, and by the time I went off to college at 18, I'd had the, the opportunity to travel to a handful of spots, including internationally. So I'd had like experience in different cultures and da, da, da. And I didn't, I didn't allow for that with New York. I thought it's, it's within the States, it's a place I've been a bunch, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and, and so some of the cultural differences, like not weather aside, like some of the cultural differences just were something that I have really had to get used to, like um, the language. Mm -hmm. Hella fools, that's what we say out here, like call someone a fool in New York and see how that goes over. Other way around, kid, like, yo, don't call me kid, don't call me son, I am not your child. Like, so there's just little, little things like that. Um, and then also, like, what's polite, what's rude. In the Bay Area, a cat will, like, yeah, yeah, I would hang out sometimes, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then it might just never happen. In New York, be yeah. like, well, I'm, well, I'm going to hang out with you, son. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like straight up, I'll just tell you. So, like, there, there were little things like that. And then in the schooling context, you know, Columbia University, Ivy League school, founded before the Union, and King's College, like a level of wealth, a level of whiteness that I had not experienced out here. I mean, I, I thought I knew rich people, you know, they got the house in the hills and the uplands here, like it's a, it's a different different thing. Maybe, maybe that switched up with the tech and all that since then. Um, but you know, I, I mentioned that I, uh, as I, at Berkeley High, one of the big things in my, as an upperclassman, we painted this mural like it was, we started the Campus Beautification Club. We thought we were freaking the system. Like, okay, we'll call it the Campus Beautification. We knew that there was this graffiti abatement coming from the city council. So we were like, okay, yeah, if we want to have, stop kids from tagging on, on all the walls, let's give a dedicated wall for these artists. It's a beautiful project, mural still running at Berkeley High. And, and when I showed up to Columbia, I remember looking around and being like, oh, they're not going to let me paint on these walls. <laughs> they're not going to let no, me paint won't. on these walls. <laughs> and, so yeah, it was, a, it was a different, it was a different style. And, 
And I was like, a, continue to be, but like real California kid, you know? And so how I talked, how I held myself and smoking weed out there when like they were like, they will arrest you and send you to Rikers, you know? Mm -hmm. So like that was like, oh God, this is a whole nother, mm -hmm. another style. And so it was just a lot of adjustment and, and, and then the weather and like, you know, that's like, it seems straightforward enough. Um, but let me tell you, brother, as someone from out here, it's <laughs> I don't know how it is the other way around, how you've been liking it or not liking it. Um, but it was a kick in the ass. I mean, there, there are some beautiful days. Um, but that winter, it was I, I was, I was miserable. I was miserable. I don't know how else to put it. Like, I got through it, and I, like, what, what I realized a couple years in, when I, like, quieted my own complaining down <laughs> enough to hear the other people, I was like, wait, y'all are complaining too. Like, y'all yeah. don't love this either. Like, well, how's this? Um, but, but, but the seasons, we got the seasons. Yeah. All right, all right. Like, the birds, yeah. birds nest at different times here. Like, it gets darker earlier at different yeah. times here. We got seasons. We just don't have that season. So anyway, it, it was it was an adjustment in many ways. But I, I think in around actually that same timeline after a couple years and granted, I'm 18, 19, so figuring things out. But like when I realized it wasn't necessarily about, oh, the Bay so much better and the, the New York so much better, because I go back before I come. I remember coming back my first winter break here and coming back to California and me and a buddy who were going to NYU missed a handful of parties, a house party. Cause we were like, oh yeah, okay, we'll get there at 11, we'll, you know, it's like we're on New York time and we show up and we're like, yeah, we're like, we're shutting down. Like where, where y'all been? And so I was like, oh yeah, New York's better cause you stay out late. Oh, California's better cause you get Mexican food. And then I was like quieted that down enough to be like, wow, what a privilege to be able to spend time in this amazing and dynamic space and this amazing and dynamic space. And so once I kind of turned that corner, it unlocked it in a way and where it's like I can be at the West Indian Festival mm -hmm. and before school starts and then, you know, I can come back here and be a Dia de los Muertos or, or whatever and, and just have these counterpoints and that, that just rounded it out and made it sweet. But it took some, took some time before I got to that. Yeah, well, I, it's it's always nice to have experiences and kind of different cultural touch points. To, uh, just you know, giving as you gave those examples around the festivals and, and parades and things like that, and just the differences season wise and and all that. So you get the kind of both both coasts. You get to see how they how they work and operate and how people work and operate. Yeah, which uh, yeah, that that can uh, yeah, they, you can want to laugh from that. 